Father, again, we come in the precious name of Jesus, asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> have your Bibles. I want us to turn to the book of Genesis, the first chapter, and the 26th verse. The Bible says here, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In the third chapter, uh, the eighth verse, I believe it is, says, And they heard, that is Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. I read these two to help you to see that we were made in the image of God and we were made to have fellowship with God. He made you to have fellowship with Him. And He's interested in every little thing about us. I remember a couple of several weeks ago, once in a while, I was out playing golf with my wife, and we were over to Carter Cave, and we were playing golf, and she knocked the ball over in the middle of some trees. And uh, she hunted and hunted and could not find it, and finally she stopped and prayed a little prayer and said, Jesus, will you help me to find that ball? Now, why did she want to find it? Was it an expensive ball? No, it wasn't expensive. Uh, did somebody special give it to her? No, nobody special gave it to her. Could she, did she have any more? Yes, she had other balls. Well, why did she pray that? She, uh, why did she pray that way? Lord, help me to find this ball. She liked it. She just liked that ball. That's all. She just liked it. And so she said, Jesus, will you help me to find that ball? And when she quit praying, she looked down and she was standing right over <laughs> now, I think I told you some time ago, about the time I was hunting for a pair of glasses, I lost my glasses, and I was hunting outside the house for them, and I couldn't find them anywhere, and I needed my glasses. So I finally prayed a little prayer when I was standing outside the house, and I said, Lord, where are my glasses? Will you show me where they are? And just came just as sweetly inside of me, either up in the eaves trough. I thought, oh, that can't be. And uh, I just passed it off. I thought, well, that just can't be. So I just started to leave it, and I thought, came to me, well, well, it won't hurt anything to get the ladder and look. So I got the ladder and looked, and there they were, up in the eaves trough. And then I remember the day before, I'd gotten on the roof, but I had my hammer, and you're going to hammer a nail in or something like that. And when I bent over, the glasses must have slid out of my pocket. I had them in my pocket, down the roof, and in the eaves trough. Now, Jesus knew where they were, and what I'm trying to tell you this is that God is interested in every little thing about your life. If he's interested in finding a golf ball just because she likes it, or to help me to find a pair of glasses or something, and I know doubt a number of you have had experiences similar to that, so God is interested in every little thing about us. Now, when Israel or God's children were down in Egypt and they came out after 400 years of slavery, and I want to look, to look at some things here about that, this when God delivered them. The history of Israel has been a history of finding this fellowship with God. From Egypt, through the wilderness, and through Canaan. And they had to learn to trust God before they could live in Canaan. That's the reason for the wilderness. They had to learn to trust God. Canaan, do you know Canaan was a land of faith? Everything in Canaan was a land of faith, and if they didn't have faith, they couldn't live there. So they had to learn that. Now, when they came out, of some of the lessons that God was trying to teach us as well, when they came out of Egypt, some of the lessons they learned. God told them, if you remember, to spoil the Egyptians. Isn't that interesting? God said, now you go to your Egyptian friends and neighbors and you borrow gold and silver and the things that you borrow from them. You say, well, that isn't fair. Well, they were just getting the pay they hadn't received in years 
by being slaves in Egypt. So they weren't getting anything they shouldn't get. So I want you to see something here, though. God said, you go borrow all the, coal, the, the, the gold and the silver, and they went out of Egypt loaded. It says they spoiled the Egyptians. Well, what's one of the lessons that I want us to get out of there? First of all, I want you to know it's a lesson that God wants to prosper you. Now stick with me now. It was God that told them to go borrow money. I mean, get from all the Egyptians and get it and take it. It's God's will, and that is still the same today. It said in 1 John, I would that your soul prospers even as, I mean, your soul, you prosper even as your soul prospers, that you'll be in health. So look, the second one is, it says in Psalm 105 that when they went out of there that there was not one, I can't take this in, there was not one feeble one among them, over a million people, and you couldn't find a feeble person. What is God trying to tell us? It's God's will to heal you. If it were to said he healed most of them, I could understand that. So I gather from this, it is God's will to heal every one of you. Not one feeble one among them. Well, that was when they ate the lamb, and getting out of there, they ate the lamb, and as soon as they ate the lamb, they got well. That the lamb simplifies Jesus. You feed on Jesus, and he wants to heal. The third thing they learned was the power of the blood. And when the blood was sprinkled on the doorposts, and I love that, because God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. They were to put the blood on the doorpost, and it didn't make any difference how sinful they were. If they got under the blood, they were saved. It has nothing to do with how bad you've been, the sins you've committed. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. If you can get under the blood, it'll save you. That's the power of the blood. But the devil come out, oh, look how bad you've been, awful the thing you've done. It doesn't make any difference. God just said, when I see the body, he didn't, he didn't come down and question who all's in the house and what have you done? Have you good enough, you good enough to get under the body? He didn't say anything like that at all. He just said to get under the blood and the death angel, when he goes through the land, uh, he'll not, he'll pass over you. So, we, those, so those things we need to learn, we learned when coming out of Egypt. You see, in Canaan, God said, I will put none of these diseases upon you that I put on the Egyptians. In Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter, it said it would be a land to eat bread without scarceness and not lack anything, a land of iron and brass. Everything they needed would be in that land. That's why they had to have faith to walk in it. Deuteronomy 11 said to walk in God's ways would be like days of heaven on earth. This is what God said. We talk about getting to heaven someday. God says, why don't you bring heaven down here? You can. We can. We can bring it down here. So Canaan was a land of prosperity and a land of health. This is what they were heading for. This is spiritually just as true of us today. If we walk with God and God tries to do it, but it's a land where we must learn faith. So the gold and silver, God prospered them. Now, this is interesting to me. God prospered them with gold and silver, and they came out rich. But I want you to notice something. With the wealth that they came out of, they built a golden calf with it. Could it be that, the, that as God prospers us, that we'll build a golden calf with what God prospers us? That we'll build an idol to worship? This truth is still for us today. It's here, and it's just as much for us. And I have a feeling that in America we've built many idols because of the prosperity that God's given to America. So we need to be careful that we don't make gods out of what God prospers us with. Now, before going into Canaan, they had to learn to trust God. That's why God brought them to one place after another to see if they trust him. And the Bible says in, what is it, uh, Numbers, the 14th chapter and 23rd verse, that God tested them ten times to see if they'd trust him. He brought them to a hard situation to see if they, and they failed ten times. God brought them there to see 
So some of the places that God put you in, he may be testing you to see whether or not you'll pass the test or not before you can get into something that God wants you to have. You sticking with me now? So God took the children of Israel and uh, trained them. Now, you know they had to stay there for 40 years. And this is very interesting to me, is that the older ones, all over 20 years of age, died in the wilderness. I mean, yeah, died. And, uh, but the young ones God took and they, keep, they, they keep, he kept them in the wilderness for 40 years, these young people. He, so he took them and trained them for Canaan. How did he train them? He trained them by denying them uh, or because of, by keeping them uh, from, from de they, were, they were deprived, I'll put it that way. They were deprived for 40 years. He trained them by depriving them. Notice this is the opposite of what their parents had. Their parents had everything in Egypt. They ate what they wanted to. They had good homes. Uh, they had good clothes. But the young people were deprived of the food of Egypt. They were deprived of new clothes. They were deprived of new shoes. They were deprived of social life. They were deprived of everything. God was teaching them something. If you young people are being deprived of something, you can be thankful. God's teaching you for something that lies ahead. Some of you maybe have seen this black brother that preaches on TV, this brother Jake's preaches now, maybe what sometimes I've seen there, looks like a crowd, maybe 25,000 people. And one of the little booklets I have of his, he was telling what a deprived condition that he lived under as a boy, a young, young man growing up and starting out preaching, preaching to just a little, just a few people and deprived of money and income and seemed like of everything. And yet God was testing him to see if he'd keep going. Will you keep going when God's testing you? Or will you quit? And now after the tests are over, God's got him, pre got him preaching to 25,000 people. A black boy who stood the test. Can we be deprived and still love God? What is this thing that God tries to teach us? If we can't learn it in prosperity, we'll have to learn it in being deprived. Ah, there's some great truth here, dear ones. I trust we get a hold of it. We're living in a day of prosperity and it can ruin us, but we can, you know, that doesn't mean we're all, prosperity doesn't have to ruin us. I think of one of the great uh, social women, I think it was a Russian, I forget her name. She said she was saved by an M. Or it says, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the weak, the despised, the rejected, and things that are not to bring to naught the things that are. So there's some noble get in, some stay there. She said, so I got saved by an M. Said, not many, no, but she said, I got in on the M. So God can save anybody, any, whether they have wealth or not. And so the people were stayed in the wilderness, these young people were stayed in the wilderness, they were deprived of all the things their parents had. Did you hear what I said? They were deprived of all the things that parents had. And all they heard for 20 years was God. They saw God in the morning. They saw him at night. They saw him at noonday. They heard him talk about God. And when they came out of there after 20 years, they had faith to conquer Canaan. They had been taught it. They would, Jesus backed them in a corner and taught them and they learned faith. For 20, for 40 years they learned it, so that when they moved into Canaan, they had faith to take it. They learned faith. You couldn't live in Canaan without faith. Faith, Canaan was conquered by faith. So, they had, they were tested, as I said, these many times. Well, Today, it's hard to trust God because of prosperity. Now, you can, but it's hard. So don't feel sorry for the young people if they're being deprived of something. 
what God has for them, it is amazing if they'll stick with it. So when these had learned to trust God, God said, all right, you can go into Canaan. You, you'll trust me now. And the very first city they went to was Jericho, a walled city, great city. And they were to march around seven times on the seventh day, march around seven times. And notice the instructions that were given. Joshua said, now on the seventh day you march around seven times and don't let one word proceed out of your mouth. I want to tell you they had to learn obedience and trust or you could have never kept these hundreds of thousands of soldiers quiet and never said a word. He said, don't let one word. They had to learn obedience before and to trust God and to trust Joshua. They had to learn that before they could ever enter Canaan. But they proved faithful. They kept quiet. They never said one word. I can't imagine that many people together and not one word coming out of their mouth. Think how hard that would be. Not one word were they to say in coming out of Canaan. So before Israel could enter Canaan, they had to learn about faith. Canaan cannot be conquered in any other way than by faith. The victories of the Christian life are all conquered by trusting God and faith. And God has to teach us that. And we learn it by the situations and circumstances we're in. So I'm trusting that God will help us to be faithful in our times of testing because Canaan lies ahead. What lies ahead for everybody in this building? I do not know, but I know this. I know it's wonderful if we can stand the test and walk in the garden and learn to trust him. If we can't, then we'll lose it. Canaan lies ahead for every one of us. But it's a land that you have to walk in by faith. You can't walk in it any other way. And so God took all these years to train these young people to walk by faith, and then the land was theirs. And when they got in there, God said, the first thing he said was, that Jericho, I want the first thing I want you to do, I want you to tithe. <laughs> Isn't that something? God said, that city's mine. I want all the gold, all the silver, everything in it. Don't you keep any of it. It all belongs to me. And before they could learn to walk, and before they could start into Canaan, they had to learn to tithe. Before you can go deep with God that you want to, one of the first lessons you'll have to learn is tithing. Come on, I want you to stick with me now. This is Bible truth, and uh, we, we need to learn what God is showing us these things. He said in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, uh, that the things that we see there are examples to us. They're, they we're to learn by them. And uh, so they had to learn to tithe. God said, I want it all. That just doesn't quite seem fair, does it? They conquered that great city. They marched around it. They were obedient. Get in and see all that gold and that silver. And God said, now don't you touch that. That's mine. And then he said, you can have the rest. All of King. You can have it all. But I want you to give me something. I want you to give me the first. Put me first. Seek the kingdom of God first. I'm sometimes wondering if we know what the word first means. First. So they had to put God first and give him all the silver. Well, you know the story, you read it of Achan. He thought, oh, this gold and silver looks so nice. He kept a little bit of it and a good little Babylonian scar and hid it in his tent. Thought, well, we can give us. I'll just keep that. But it stopped all of Israel. God said, you can't go any farther. There's sin in the camp. And it stopped Israel from moving because one man refused to obey and trust God. So, dear ones, Canaan is a wonderful land. God's prepared a spiritual Canaan for us that we can live there, delightful. He wants us to be prosperous. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to trust him in little things. He loves you, but he'll train you and teach you to, to have fellowship with him day by day and every little thing about your life. Even the hairs of your head are numbered. What a wonderful God we serve. How interested is he in you and in me? A wonderful, wonderful God. A God that would be delighted to help my wife find a little yellow golf ball. Why? 
She liked it. What a wonderful God to give us something, give us the desires of our heart. I wonder if we understand, trust how much God loves us, loves you, the things he's planned for us are marvelous to behold if we'll trust him and believe him.